Uh, so I'm MJ Malkidi, I'm from Game Over Books, and you are here to celebrate this fierce blessing of a book, God Morning's Tiger Nights by Yuha Braha. Uh, so excited, so excited for this beautiful book and to have everyone here tonight. Uh, please give all the love in the world to the author in the chat right now. This is super exciting. Uh, also, we are going to have a couple openers this evening. Really excited to have uh, Chisara with us and Ariel Francisco tonight. They're going to be our openers. And honestly, I, you're here for the poems. You're here for the art. You're here for the love of the words. So I'm not going to get in the way of that <laughs> too much longer. And we're just going to get right into it. So just uh, thank you all for being here. You could be anywhere in the world and you're here tonight celebrating with us. We really appreciate it. Uh, so with that, I'm going to get Chisara's bio up really quick. Uh, Chisara Oklu they them is an Igbo American poet, artist, writer, and retired physician. Her work has been featured with fellowships and residencies from Anafora Arts, Brooklyn Poets, Cave Canem, McDowell, and Palace Collective, no big deal, an alumni of the 2022 Tin House Writer Winter Workshop. Uh, writings appear in Hayden's Fairy Review, Obsidian, Cutthroat, Cider Press Review, The Washington Post, and more. Their anthropoetic approach to poetry excavates spiritual, oral, and print archives of West Africa and its diaspora to reveal its rituals, traumas, and joy. They are the founder of The Joy Well, a creative arts platform supporting African-descended women in art and healing. No big deal at all. <laughs> <laughs> so please, I'm going to bring them up right now. Let me add the spotlight here and take it away. Thank you, MJ. Oh my gosh. Duhai! Congratulations. I am so happy for you. You are amazing and your smile is infectious. Keep doing it. <laughs> I am so happy to be able to read and sort of uh, be, what is it? What is it they call when you have a concert? There's the headliner, Nuha, and then the opening act. Yes, that's what it is. So thank you absolutely for the honor to, to be able to help you with this. Um, I'm going to be reading some new and old stuff. Some stuff has been published. Others of it is new, as, as we like to say in Women Writers in Bloom, a group that I'm a part of in New York. It's new shit. So, um, you know, I'm an artist and I'm sensitive about my ish. So <laughs> there it is. Um, I'll begin with a poem that is uh, sort of in the uh, tradition of found poetry. It is from Audre Lorde's Apartheid USA, an essay that was written in 1985. But this was published, this poem was published in Berkeley Poetry Review. It's called 10 Moments Last Summer. 10. Granny's on the stoop waiting for the fire to come. Nine, and the bully boys stick together talking their rot. Their sense of urgency is fire and shots. They own these streets on a technicality, so what? Eight, Granny is in her garden listening to the moon talk about cities of gold. Seven, summer is a teenage dream lulled to sleep by fire. And even if the moon's eye be the sign of hope, nothing comes, no one comes. Six, state of emergency. Euphemism for black boys listening to music, black girls reading a book and the whole world drinking a can of Coca-Cola. Five, Fellas with gleaming white teeth look at us square and give us a remedy wet with blood. This is privilege. Four, humanity can go destroy itself now. Three, the Brotherhood of Fire listens to music while considering the destruction of Africanness. Fire is another kind of privilege. Two, Granny knows the hope of Black boys and Black girls is one more summer moon on the stoop, making cities of gold in their minds. Yet now, only the dead line her dreams. One, she eyes the firemen guarding the charred remains. They refuse to leave. Bully boys sticking together, talking their rot, while a summer of Black children burn in the streets and whatnot. So this next poem is from a collection I'm working on based on the Biafra War. 
Um, that, that's also known as the Nigerian Civil War. Uh, my family is from Nigeria. Um, and during the time, I'll actually read the, the epigraph to this, to this poem. In Enugu, Enugu is a city in Nigeria. It became the seat of the Republic of Biafra during the Nigerian Civil War. Radio Biafra, headquartered in Enugu, transmitted daily status updates from the war front to the, war, to the people of Biafra. As starvation and death overwhelmed the Republic, the voice of Radio Biafra became like that of God. When God sat in Enugu, we wondered who we were. Enugu State, Biafra, 1968. One. The stream that catches war's peculiar rainfall or the spigot from where salt sprinkles the morning, the crack where groans seep into sky or the spear of salvation, or the Israelites hearing from the God cloud claiming their promised land or skin draped rubies strung from barbed wire trees, the groan clotting in God's throat while our fate clings to wiretaps, did he barb wire trees to the sky to keep us from clinging? Is our blood the rainfall that puts God at ease? Are we just fetching him from the stream of our lives? Two, we seep into trees, into sky falling, keep our seer cries out of God's hearing, grown streams of barbed wire to catch the war falling, to catch the war falling from the sky. God sits on rubies, hangs our fear out every morning. Barb wires a tree in the shape of a promise. We sip rubies from the stream every morning and after hang throats out to dry. Three. Oh, Enugu sky, morning from where ruby salt falls, from where cloud-filled promises wandered. Finally, at ease salvation. And that one was published in About Place Journal. Um, just FYI, if you want to look them up, it's a, it's a fantastic uh, journal. Um, let me see. I'm going to read. Okay, yeah, let me lighten it up just a little bit. Okay. This one is called Hungry. Yeah. Hungry. It's About Place Journal. Let me, yeah, I just happened to catch that. <laughs> this one is called Hungry. When we are mango sweet and avocado fat, when we are pear crisp and honey dew dripping, when we are mint watermelon refreshing our tongues in each other's mouths, we are right. Uh, okay. This one's, um, this one's also kind of new-ish, so I'm just gonna share it here, see what happens. Labor. The Lower Valley people come to eat honey off the amputated bee's amber grave. When the fever in the air gets caught in their skin, they lay against the coolness of a tombstone, watching the dark night jackhammer the sky. Sometimes they split the dog fat of a devil's supper apart to forget the sharp blade of laboring under white hot sun. Yet and still come morning, then night, on desert's soft patch, they fall asleep, if only to smile. So these next two, um, are one is in response to Michael Brown's murder. And the second is in response to Lucille Clifton, but they're both for young black men who are being murdered at the hands of state sanctioned government. Witness, for Michael and Philando and Amadou and Tamar and. Arc of bright red smears baby blue sky. His flesh, his bones broken, twisted. Rendered mute flesh of his mother's flesh. Burned onto the retina of A. 
flattened into snapshots, resurrected a. In hyperbolic terms, news feeds and algorithms a. Batons wake the neighborhood. Sirens wake the neighborhood. Pow pow wake the neighborhood. The neighborhood is the blood bears. No one calls a to unwake this mothering wail. Call silence a witness. No one forgiven yet, no one stands as a rotten body is not a body if it is caught in the act of black quotidian disruption that bears false witness unsees the blood spray on asphalt and t-shirts this fabled launch pad of maggot dreams now stands as Souvenir for future historians, excavating the body born black, black born museum artifacts. Behold the closed eye mouth of catacombed streets, sanguined, silenced. The boys are from Michael and Philando and Amadou and Tamar and the boys are frolicking again, daisies and marigolds nesting in their sheened froze, ambered glee gushing from between soft lips. The boys are dancing again, pockets filled with posies, nimble feet, legs leaping over limber bodies, traipsing through fields of dandelions and cornflowers. The boys are their wrists adorned with lavender, their eyelashes a flutter of grace. They curtsy and they bow to each other and passers-by, grin full teeth, laugh geysers of joy, then tumble into softest earth. I see them knowing this be their brief moment to shine. I'm going to end with uh, lucky ones. Lucky ones. And what of the green clover who is satisfied with its three leaves? The rainbow who knows its gold shimmers in the curve of its long prismed reach. The rabbit who escapes the hunter's trap and traipses toward its burrow on its own hind feet. The fowl whose clavicle remains intact for another day despite one's wishes. And what of us living all that is possible beyond this black white world? Aren't we the lucky ones, miracle makers of a divine kind? Thank you. Nuha! Oh, sorry. I didn't even know. I, I was so excited. I didn't realize I was still muted. That was like, <laughs> I was just like, oh my God, this is like, uh, beautiful. Uh, absolutely amazing. I believe someone in the chat said that uh, Chisara makes an incredible uh, door kicker. And I just want to reiterate that because it's 100% true. I believe it was uh, Atina. So thank you for saying that because 100% agree that powerful, incredible. Thank you so much. Uh, oh my God. It's readings like that that remind me. I'm like, yeah, this is why we're here. This is what we're doing, right? Like, <laughs> we're here for that good. So with that in mind, we're going to keep this right rolling. We're going to get Ariel right up here. So really quick, I'm going to bring up the intro. Uh, Ariel Francisco is the author of Under Capitalism, If Your Head Aches, They Just Yanked Off Your Head, Flower Song Press 2022, A Sinking Ship is Still a Ship, Borough Press 2020, and All My Heroes Are Broke, CNR Press 2017, and the translator of the Haitian Dominican poet, Chiquisva Renoud's Poet of One Island, Get Fresh Books 2023, and the Guatemalan poet, Hali Lopez Routine slash Goodbyes, Duvel 2022, a poet and translator born in the Bronx to Dominican and Guatemalan parents, and raised in Miami. His work has been published in The New Yorker, American Poetry Review, Academy of American Poets, Poem A Day, The New York City Ballet, Latino Book Review, and elsewhere. Whew. Oh my God. 
<laughs> okay. He is the assistant professor of poetry and Hispanic studies at Louisiana State University. Please, please give a warm welcome to Ariel. Let me get you spotlighted. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having me. And um, yeah, let me try to follow that up. That was fantastic. Jeez. Um, and thank you all for coming out for, for celebrating uh, Nuha. I'm super excited um, to be here. But also the, the book is fantastic. Y'all got to get it. And um, I feel very lucky to have witnessed the, uh, the birth of a lot of those poems. Um, so congrats, Nuha. We're all very proud of you um, and super excited that your work is in the world. I'm just going to read uh, seven poems for you guys, and, and we'll skip along to the main attraction. Um, and also, it's, it's storming a bit where I'm at right now. So hopefully, I don't lose power. I know the power goes out pretty easily here in Louisiana. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm going to read you guys the seven newish poems. Uh, this first one is called Dissociating While Staring Out the Window Just Before a Thunderstorm After Driving 15 Hours Home. A small spider has strung up a curling yellowed leaf in its web like a little hammock or god clipping a crescent moon in a desolate summer sky. Thunder booms a countdown to something catastrophic. I unpack blessed. My mom has slipped another crucifix into my bag as she does every time I visit, like she's smuggling crude artifacts out of some besieged city and they're starting to accumulate. Little plastic Jesus, I loop around every doorknob of my small home, his expressionless head hanging as though it's finally hitting him that he actually died for our sins, blank plastic eyes following me everywhere. When I can't sleep, I imagine them staring up at the sun, floating in the future's oceans with the rest of the world's plastic, forever awaiting the rapture. The spider curls into the leaf's concave, an illusion of protection. I curl into my notebook, an illusion of protection, tiny. Uh, and this next one, sorry, I'm reading from my computer because um, I don't have a printer here. This next one, uh, this is actually the first poem that I wrote uh, about Louisiana, maybe the first poem I wrote in Louisiana, and actually wrote it after the first uh, graduate student reading at um, at Highland Coffee. And I swear, I swear to God, I saw a flamingo, and everyone kept telling me it was a spoonbill, and I, I refused to believe it. Uh, so it's called Bat in Blue. Winter's revelation is always the same, longing. A flamingo flies overhead, a pink ax cutting through the sky, I think of Tony Montana, alone in his hot tub, his world and everything in it on the cusp of collapse, watching a nature documentary, seeing the flamingos taking flight and yelling, fly, pelican. I think of Florida. I think of home. The haters will say the bird you see above is simply a spoonbill, but they're just trying to bring you down, man. I think of only seeing flamingos on lottery billboards, a good omen. I think of how Baton Rouge was once part of West Florida. I think of how nothing escapes the swamp's reclamation. I think of Charles Morton, who thought birds flew to the moon for winter. We all have moons we long to return to. I watch the flamingo. I watch until it fades into the pink of sunset, until it becomes what is missing. Uh, and speaking of missing things, so I grew up in Miami and there's um, there was this really fantastic bar venue, like this punk venue called Churchill's, which had been around since the 70s, and it closed during the pandemic, uh, and it still hasn't reopened, and so I wrote this kind of elegy for it. Um, spent a lot, of, a lot of nights there. Uh, it's called Even Churchill's is Closing. Yes, named after a war criminal. Yes, his ugly mug adorned the entryway, but still we defied his baby face scowl with our dancing, our sweat misting the air, someone circling and stomping until they were vomiting in the bathroom that looked like it was cleaned, maybe once every presidential term, re-elections not included, watching the jacuzzi boys or radio boxer or some other flicker of light that carried us through yet another night of rum and cokes and the cheapest beer imaginable, keeping the rest of the world at bay by singing at the top of our young lungs until our voices ghosted us and our limbs wobbled like jello shots as we staggered into the incoherent darkness, bracing itself to be smothered by dawn, as we staggered out like wounded soldiers, arms around shoulders, 
holding each other up in the gravel that passes for a parking lot where the man in his reflective vest, who we paid $5 to watch our cars from potential thieves, including him, salutes us with a smile bright as the rising sun. Somebody pulled a very cruel prank too. They put a, a sign over the Churchill sign that said, um, I think uh, a Chili's was gonna open there, but it ended up just being a prank. Um, this next poem, so I, I don't know how many people did this, uh, but I grew up in Florida and, and me and my brother, when we were kids, we would catch lizards and um, they get very angry when you catch them and they'll bite onto anything. And so we would catch them and we would put them up to our ears and our lips and we would just kind of wear them <laughs> like jewelry. Um, I can't remember what reminded me of that. I think being in Louisiana actually, because the landscape reminds me very much of Florida. Uh, so this is called Young Lizard Kings. Under the Florida sun's stern gaze, parents too busy fighting to watch us in the yard. My brother and I hunt for lizards in the loquat trees, brimming with many suns, chase them skittering across the porch or through the tall grass. If you pinch their tails, it snaps off and they shoot into the foliage like a bottle rocket. You have to grab them by the middle with thumb and forefinger like a cigarette, their little mouths open in rage or fear, bearing tiny harmless teeth at us. We raise them as though offering them to the sun before offering them our earlobes and lower lip, letting them clamp down in rage or fear and wear them as living jewelry, breathing green gems clinging to our skulls. We roam the neighborhood like this, little deformed Mayan deities, young lizard kings, our providence adorning our faces, seeking to remake this world. Uh, just three more for you guys. Um, this one, I, I do like to kind of, um, I have a couple of poems about thinking I see UFOs in the sky, uh, which the tone of that has kind of changed recently with the stuff. So this predates UFOs being all over the news recently. I just want to, I do want to say that. Um, and it makes a reference to Yuri Gagarin, who was the first man in space. And um, when I was little, I was kind of obsessed with space and my dad used to he wondered why that was. And so he did his dad research. My dad is a very curious person. And he found out that I have the same birthday as Yuri Gagarin. And that, to him, that explained why I love space. Um, so that just gives you a sense of what my dad's like. Uh, so this is called Seeing a UFO and Singing Frank Sinatra's Fly Me to the Moon into the Night at the Top of My Lungs. How many poems does a guy have to write to get abducted by aliens? I know you see me, same as the fat moon peeping through the trees like a pervert. I just want to talk. My arms are sore from waving. My dad used to wonder why I was always so fascinated with space, then learned I share a birthday with Yuri Gagarin, and that explained everything. I would watch that shit show Ancient Aliens with my mom, and she would say, you know, in Guate, we remember where the Mayans came from, raising her eyebrows into orbit. How could I not grow up to search the skies for meaning? Ancient peoples thought objects soaring through the atmosphere were celestial serpents, their glowing tails slithering through space. Quetzalcoatl, is that you? I feel like the last kid sitting in front of the school waiting to be picked up. Don't say you've forgotten about me. Uh, and this next one, I um, so my, my mom's family is from Guatemala. I hadn't been there. Uh, since I was in high school and I spent, I was lucky enough to spend the last Christmas there and I saw a lot of my aunts and they have a peculiar kind of sense of humor. And we visited my grandparents' grave um, and my, my aunt thought that would be a good time to ask me what, what I want done with my body when I die. <laughs> um, so this is called visiting my grandparents' grave. My aunt asks how I'd like to be buried. One, al volcán, throw me into the volcano the one you can see from the roof of Abuela's old house, so that when it spews its ash into the air, you'll see me taking shape in the smoke slowly rising. Two, al mar, throw me into the sea. The Spanish words for waves and hello are homophones, hola and hola. In a country that meets both great oceans, greet me on either coast and watch me wave hello. And, uh, this will be the last poem. Uh, so thank you all again for coming out and thank you for having me. Um, this poem, uh, 
I can't remember what sparked this memory, but I thought it was like a fake memory uh, of seeing Evil Knievel jump over the Grand Canyon. And so I looked it up and it was actually his son. Uh, and it actually happened uh, on my mom's birthday, which I thought was uh, kind of crazy the way, you know, the way memory can kind of turn into a poem. Um, so it's called Watching Robbie Knievel Jump the Grand Canyon in 1999. My mom's first birthday post-divorce Duplex in the sidewalkless outskirts of Orlando. One TV for the four of us. One bathroom for the four of us. Two bedrooms for the four of us. The frogs who made a home of the window I see cheer the daredevil on. You can make a home anywhere, I guess. We watch Robbie Knievel rev his motorcycle to achieve what his father could not. A second generation dream dressed all in white. We watch as he angels through the air an inverse Icarus for a few seconds of flight, but a crash landing is still a landing, and a home is a home is a home. Thank you. I'm gonna unmute myself this time. Make sure I'm doing this right. Thank you so much, Ariel. It, absolutely incredible. This is just some great openers tonight. The energy is infectious. Even the cat's trying to get in. Like, let me get a bar. I, <laughs> oh my God. Like, let me get a poem and everyone's excited. Uh, thank you so much, Ariel. Uh, please, everybody, give some love to Chisara and Ariel Francisco, our openers for this evening. Incredible. Uh, and I am going to bring up the main event, Newha, what we're all here for. Uh, just so everyone knows, after Newha's reading, we will have a little bit of a Q&A with the author. So if anyone, as you're listening to poems tonight, has any questions that you would like to ask Newha, please throw them in the chat. I want to make sure I get to them. I've got some that I've written, but I don't want it to hear just me. I want to hear from you all. And I know from this chat, you are not shy. So <laughs> usually I'm a little worried about it. But tonight, I have a feeling you're going to have some questions. So with that, I'm going to bring up Nuha's bio real quick. Uh, Nuha Fariha is a first-generation queer Bangladeshi writer. Her work has appeared in Roadrunner Review, Magma, Thin Air, and elsewhere. Her writing has been supported by Nafora Arts, Key West Literary Seminar, Juniper Summer Writing Institute, and Mountain Words Literary Festival. She is currently earning her MFA in creative writing at Louisiana State University. This is her first book right here, God Mornings, Tiger Nights. You can learn more about her at newhawrights.com. I'm going to get the hell out of the way <laughs> unless you do your thing. All right. All right. Well, thank you all. Thank you all so much. Thank you all for all the love in the chat and just for really coming together as a community. Um, thank you to Ariel and Chisara for being such amazing openers. Like, I feel like I can't follow y'all up, but I'm going to try my best. Um, thank you to Game Over Books for publishing and supporting my work. Thank you to Josh and Catherine for designing this incredible cover with the two tigers. It is my favorite image ever. Um, thank you to Jenna and the entire Anafra team for helping me with publicity and to all my friends and the entire Nefra Fellowship for showing up tonight. Y'all are incredible. Um, this book has just been a really long journey that I did not expect to be on, but I'm very glad that I am here. Um, and the first poem that I'll be reading for you guys is called In Which I See the Tigers in the Cage and Cry, um, which is really the inspiration behind the whole collection. In Which I See the Tigers in the Cage and Cry. Tiger as myth. Fearsome Tigger leaps from Blake's history books. Lonesome Shere Khan hunts for Mowgli. Tigger jumps next to Pooh. Raja strides next to Jasmine. Richard Parker carries pie through the Atlantic Ocean. Tony cries great from every American cereal box. Tiger as homeland. Tiger statues on grandpa's wooden desk with the fan rotating clockwise and the hum of chickens and cicadas in the courtyard. Tigers carved on the train's railings as we waved goodbye. Tigers painted on the sides of rickshaws, flashes of orange, black, and white in the blistering heat of Taka traffic. Tigers prowl the village after dark and snatch babies through unguarded windows. Tiger as allegory. Tigers free from mangrove to mangrove as the water tides rise higher and higher. 
Tigers facing the blunt end of a colonizer shotgun as they limp into the forest. Tiger sits in cages. Tiger has muzzled mouth, declawed feet, drooping head, shaggy sunken coat. Tiger leaves flies buzzing in its wake. Tiger flinches from human hands. Tiger afraid of foreign lands. Tiger visits me night after night after night. Tiger chases me. I set the tigers free. So this first poem was really coming from my experience as a first year grad student at LSU, which if you're not familiar with our campus, we have a live tiger here next to the football stadium. And I was walking on my way to my car and I happened to come across this tiger and it really just made me stop and wonder about all these connections between Louisiana and Bangladesh, between my experiences as a mother and my mother's own experiences, um, between what it means to be an immigrant and what it means to be a citizen, between first and second generations. And so this collection kind of came upon all those thinkings um, and in that in-between space and in that struggle to find definition and find freedom. Um, this next poem is called Between Baba and Me, and it's dedicated to my dad and also my failed attempt to becoming a doctor. Between Baba and Me. Baba holds me up under harsh hospital lights, cradling my new wet black hair. Except it's not Baba. Only his excited yells muffle through a rusted red phone line. Except it is Baba tugging a slick umbilical cord between his stained gloved hands. Except it's my own gloved hands now, under fluorescent lights, slack with the empty space I've let slip between the lines. Um, this next poem is called God Sits in Between, and it's really heavily inspired by my love of Bollywood movies, especially um, Rabne Banade Jodi, which is one of my favorites and I highly think you should check it out. Um, okay. So God sits in between. My God was vengeful. My God left me for cold and alone for so many years. My God, I spent hours on my knees seeking forgiveness for crimes I did not commit, for guilt I inherited, for spaces I can never fit into. My God spits in my face, drags me by my feet through cobbled streets until my eyes see stars. And yet, I still love my God. I still return for her love. I still open my legs night after night. I hold a mirror in between. I look at myself and sing, I see God in you. What should I do, my beloved? I see God in you. Um, kind of along the next same lines this next poem is called Alif um, which is the first letter of the Arabic language Alif Akash recites the dua between the bodies tongue traces an Alif along an inner thigh swallows his holy response boy can change like a name when you are 11 you will kiss a girl and wonder if she loves you you don't know yet that there are things beyond love and desire, like devotion. Sweat collects in the space between bodies, on bared bone. Prayer exists only here. This next poem is called 99 Names for Baby Girls. It's one of my favorite in the collection. 99 Names for Baby Girls. Allah's messenger said, Allah has 99 names, 100 less one, and he who will memorize them all by heart will enter into paradise. To count something means to know it by name. Sahih Bukhari, Volume 9, Book 93, Hadith 489. Cooker with honey, sweets, glorious sugar, peaches and hairs, soft-haired stranger, smells like tulips, beloved roses, jasmines, violets, blessed lilies, Lotus stars and songbirds, firstborn, secondborn, eighthborn, the oldest daughter, shy and timid, my father's blessings, my mother's tears, 
promise of God. God is my father, our possession, our brand new home, our feast, a reward given, an afterthought charity, chaste homemaker, wealthy companion, warm fire, compassionate nurse, one who is alive, a songbird fantasy, say the prayers with heavy stones, a princess who has a heart of gold, beauty, a woman of high manners, noble queen, radiant precious stone, shining diamond like smooth dark wood, person of the night who loves beautiful night rain, whore, Jezebel's daughter, detesting witch, watch the woman with crown, a woman of victory, truthful ruler of the house, ruler, ruler with a spear, fighting with wrath, strong as a little bear, battle armor from the land of the broken, protector of sunrise and nightfall, fighting a battle in winter with wisdom and justice. She is one who can foresee, prideful, original sin, woman of white magic, wild as a mountain goat, torch of light, light of mind, light all round, divine woman, universal woman, God's messenger, holiness, living. Um, and so for that particular poem, I took transliterations of Arabic names for girls and it added up to 99 names exactly. And I was just really struck by the way that we name women to become vessels and we name them to become these objects in the world from a feast, from a battle, from a Jezebel, from divinity itself. Um, this next poem is called Things I'm Left With and it's a duplex after Jericho Brown. Tuesday, I am laid into cold earth. Blood stains my mother's left hand. My mother's left hand blood stains on a white damp cloth with tears. Damp white tears on a cloth, mid-March the rain falls soft. Soft rainfall stops us mid-March. She screams, open mouth, no sound. I scream, no mouth, open sound, neck tied with a yellow shoestring. My father's yellow necktie hung on an empty clothes line above. Above the line, empty of clothes, Tuesday, I'm laid into cold earth. Um, the next couple of poems, I just want to put a content warning out there. They do talk about sexual assault, especially the gruesome and bloody history of Bangladesh. Uh, following the war of 1971, which is still pretty recent history, um, at least to me and to my family. Studies in Bangla. In our biology textbooks, we read that trauma passes through multiple generations. Trauma changes the structure of our genes. How much does the rape of 400,000 women change the structure of our collective nation? In Bangla, Kalke means tomorrow and yesterday. The calendar in the hallway never goes past 1971. Dadi still runs down the tin-capped hallways, listening to ricochets, bullets, and raindrops. In our psychology books, we read, baby cats whose eyes were blinded at birth become blind even if the eyes are functioning. Amma brushes our hair every night. A quick sawing with a fine tooth comb, leaving us with red scalps and hidden tears. Until college, I thought that to care for a woman was to hear her scream. Can women who are taught to be in pain forget how to fall in love with themselves? Bami, water. Chal, rice. Bhat, cooked rice. Shanto, peaceful, good. Dhongi, prideful, bad. These are the words we teach our daughters. Love, hope, fear, dream, survival. These are the words they hold inside. In our neurology textbooks, we read, neurons that don't receive stimulus die. This is called growth. This is called survival. This is why I asked Ammo for Pani to quench my empty heart. Two more poems left. Um, this next poem is called On a Map Somewhere I Find My Grandmother's Finger. On a map somewhere I find my grandmother's finger. Every year the lines on the map get redrawn. Every year my grandmother hangs a new flag. Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, my grandmother traveled everywhere from her living room. 
She doesn't remember which nation begat her children and which nation she will die. Home is where my fingers curl around my grandmother's, the wedding ring stuck. She doesn't remember which nation she married. Can you point on a map and find me? Um, and then this will be the last poem that I'm reading tonight. Uh, thank you all for your support and definitely stick around afterwards and ask your questions. I'd love to do a little Q and A. Um, definitely support Ariel with his book, which is uh, Under Capitalism. If your head aches, they just yank your head off, which is great. And also my book. <laughs> this poem is called Too Close to the Sun We Bled. In this ending, Salma Sharif unfolds. Warm sunlight illuminates golden threads on her jainamas, rests her head against cool ground, and speaks to God through closed lips. There's no God but this God. This an ending, Salma Sharif prone, sun-soaked gold threads her head against cool ground and speaks to God in a whisper. There's no God but this God. This ending in Salma Sharif prostate, golden threads, bare skin, speaks to God in a scream. There's no God but this God. Ending this in Salma Sharif lays, bare crown, sun gold. There's no God but this God. This much I know is true. Salma Sharif never spoke. There's no God but this God. This much I know is true. And to them we will return. Thank you all. Oh my God, everyone, come on. Like, seriously, what an amazing, amazing evening. What a beautiful reading, Nuha. Oh my God. Uh, hold on, Nuha, unmute yourself. Come on, come on. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. I just, Thank you so much for letting us print this book. This is seriously such an incredible, credible book. And I am so excited for people to get their hands on this and just feel how like fierce and powerful and healing this is. Like there's gut punches, but also at the same time, there's so much room for just joy and growth in your, it just, it's it's amazing. And so I'm, I hope you feel proud of this because you should be, this is incredible. Uh, so with that, we are gonna do a little Q and A. And uh, again, I really encourage folks to throw in some questions. Uh, I've got a few here to kind of get us going, um, but would love to hear from y'all as well. Uh, so I'm gonna start off with asking a question about uh, form in particular, because you have some traditional, you know, like left side adjacent kind of stuff, but at the same time, there are some particular poems in here where it's like, okay, you found a, a, the perfect way to encapture this, right? I'm thinking of like, I'm looking at After the Flood right now in particular, like how that kind of poem goes. You have some of the bold, you know, it really feels like you're seeing certain things bubble up to the surface, right? Of what you're talking about or uh, the poem uh, Asymmetry, where you see that breakdown in form. And so I'm just curious for you as a writer, how did you intuit the forms for some of these poems? Like, how did you come to find that like, okay, this is where this is taking me, right? Like, what was that process like for you? Yeah, I mean, I'm so glad you asked that question because I think that's been something that I've been playing around in my journey as a poet. Because originally when you start out as a baby poet, you're always stuck to like, okay, I think I'm gonna <laughs> line everything up and it's gonna look like I see Robert Frost poems or like, you know, traditional poetry. But then after taking a lot of classes and reading a lot about speculative poetry in particular, it really opened up my eyes to how form can be different. And so um, I don't know if y'all can see, but after the flood is kind of like MJ was saying, it's sort of um, positioned in a really interesting way. And the thing that kind of drew me to doing that is to think of like a piece of paper submerged in floodwaters because it was, it was written right after there was a major flooding last year in Bangladesh. And so what's the sort of debris that the paper can catch and then how would that look on the page? And so that's why it's sort of disarrayed like that. Um, and so I think the form is driven a lot by the content, right? So because I was thinking about flood water and thinking about the ways in which things can compose and be decomposed, that's how the poem came to me. 
And that's how I tried to arrange it on a page. Although this particular poem was a pain in the ass. I spent a lot of hours on Canva trying to get everything <laughs> shaped up correctly. Um, but yeah, I think it's really dictated by the content and how the content wants to be presented. Thank you. Well, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, and I want to talk a little bit, obviously, you know, a, a big part of this is the Bengal tiger, right? Like it's such a powerful and, and clear symbol in this book. Uh, I know there's the cultural relevance, but I want to, I want to give some space for you to talk a little bit more about your personal relationship to this symbol and why it was so important for you to claim throughout this book, right? Like why it was so important for you to embody this particular vessel of the Bengal tiger. Yeah, I mean, I think it it's difficult because I talked about it in the beginning about just how much of an impact it came to me when I saw Mike the Tiger in that cage, when I saw him trapped away. Um, and for some reason, I could just think back to colonialism, think back to the decades and decades of my people's history, right? And how it's been taken away from us, how our arts, how our culture has been stripped away. And then I come to this town in Louisiana and I see the word Bengal like everywhere. <laughs> I can't escape it. <laughs> um, and that's what kind of made me come back again and again to this idea of tigers. Like anywhere you go on this town, you'll see like tiger stripes, you'll see the gold and the purple everywhere. Um, yeah, and so that's what kind of gave me the notion of claiming the idea of tigers for this book in particular. And also, I feel like tigers are ferocious. Tigers have so much strength that we don't always think about. Um, but at the same time, it's also a commodity that's been consumed in a lot of ways, too. So just thinking about that duality and how I can process it in this sort of a collection. Uh, and actually, you have our first audience question. Uh, Matem asks, what was the process of putting together the collection like in general? So if you want to talk about, you know, the ordering and everything like that, what was it like bringing these pieces together into the script? Yeah, I mean, that process was really therapeutic in a way. Um, so like many writers, I kind of keep a notebook and I have like a hundred or so poems that have just been accumulating over the years. And then it, to seek them out, I just kind of read through those hundred poems, did like a first round. And then after I had those titles, I kind of played around with what made sense, um, both in terms of the timeline of the poetry, but also in terms of the content and how I could see different poems kind of playing with each other a little bit. I was also inspired as at the time in Ariel's um, poetry class, and we talked a lot, we read a lot of authors' first books. Um, and we talked about how they structured their first books and the different methods that you can take, like splitting it up into sections versus leaving it all as a whole. Um, yeah, and so that conversation also kind of led me to kind of constructing this book, which I think is done mostly in chronological order and mostly by content. So. Yeah, uh, I, and also I want to comment just how important, like thinking about the not even just the time chronology, but more of like what does it make sense for the chronology of this collection, right? And one that really struck me in particular is there's the uh, poem where you reference like I can't eat eggs, like I can't do this thing, and then there's a clear reference in the end to Islamophobia, and it pays off later on in the book where you have this poem and you talk about the egging of your home and like. That hit because it because then when we got to that poem, I was like, oh my god, like it circles, you know, and so it's yeah, you did an incredible job of, of placing these out. I just have to say, because when we got to <laughs> I'm connect. very much a circular person, so I feel like I keep thinking in circles, and so I feel like that shows up in the book as well. Um, even the last poem, like it's just the same um two lines that are just kind of repeated over and over again until they're kind of broken down and decomposed. Uh, yeah. So uh, I want to ask you, because, you know, obviously th this book deals a lot with generational trauma, you know, and the healing from that. And so it's never easy to get into. It's never easy to write about or try to process. And you have done it very masterfully here. I know that took a lot of work and, and, and time. Uh, so this question is more of, you know, we got some of your cohort here, some other younger writers, and I'm wondering what, what is your advice for others that want to attempt or start to attempt to kind of do some of this in their own work, right? How do they 
how did you come to be comfortable with, you know, uh, coming up and writing about certain points of generational trauma, right? How did that come about for you? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question because on the one hand, like, especially as a writer of color, writing about gener generational trauma can become like trauma porn. So you're always kind of towing that line, but at the same time, you need to express these ideas and you need to process these really deep rooted thoughts and feelings that run through our culture. And so I think for me, it took a lot, a lot of drafts, right? I would start off by free writing um, and kind of just dumping all of my ideas onto a page. And then from there, kind of selecting the images and the motifs that felt the most important, not only for my own story, but to tell to an audience. Um, and to tell, like, what would I want other people to know about my culture? And what is it that only I can speak about, about my culture, right? And so because I have that responsibility, that's what compelled me to put these particular images and these particular ideas together. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. um... Okay, we have some more audience. I, I was like, I was so stoked. When when this audience was going off in the chat tonight, I was like, we're going to have some great questions. <laughs> <laughs> we got some people that are here tonight, and this is great. So uh, I got a question from Miguel, and then I got a question from Sunny. So uh, Miguel asks, uh, speaking of putting the book together, when did you know your book was complete? Uh, what was the point you said to yourself on the journey uh, and through this book was complete? Yeah, that's a great question. So actually, it was not when I submitted the poem, the book to Game Over Books, is I submitted it. <laughs> <laughs> like, wait, and there's still some more ideas and more thoughts that I want to flesh out a little bit more. Um, so it was really um, when I took some time away from the book, um, I went to the Juniper Writing Institute and I took a class with Evie Shockley and um, I was just walking a lot along the um, Massachusetts rivers, and I think that point I came to the conclusion that it was finally done. It was just a sense of kind of relief in a way, um, and kind of this feeling that there's nothing more that I can add to this book, right? There's nothing more that I want to say for right now. I'm good. I want some peace from this project, and it was at that point that I had submitted it. So I think. Um, to my people who are still searching and still in the process of writing their books, know that you don't have to always have a completed manuscript and that you can continue to add to it and continue to edit it um, after you submit it. Absolutely true. It's a big part of the process. <laughs> we know when a book, we know when a good script has potential. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and so Sunny, uh, first of all, Sunny says, thanks for this great reading. Ditto, incredible. Uh, any books or poems in particular that inspired you in writing this collection? Yeah, there is a lot. Actually, when I was putting together the poems for this particular reading, I was thinking a lot of Ilya Kaminsky, um, who wrote Dancing in Odessa. And he writes a lot about God, but he also writes a lot about the intergenerational trauma that he experienced as a survivor of the Soviet war. Um, so I think his work has been really seminal. Um, I also think like Zena al Sus is another poet that I really love because her work, even though it's really short, is very impactful. And that's something that I try to bring across to my work. And then Fatima Ashgar, who wrote When We Were Sisters. Uh, she's a really great South Asian poet who also writes about the particular South Asian femme experience. Uh, so I also recommend her work too. Uh, and so I have another question. I have maybe just like two more for you. Uh, if anyone else has anything though, please feel free to throw it out there. Uh, and so I'm always curious, this is something that I actually ask pretty much every author, because uh, once your book is out there, folks are reading it, they're gonna have their own personal interpretations of things, this, that, and the other. And so I'm always more curious you as the author, what, what do you hope though? people truly take, like when they're reading this collection, right? What do you hope is something that truly stands out, that resonates, that they, that they get? <laughs> do you know what I mean? 
Like, what is something that you really hope hits home in the right way, right? Because sometimes when you write a poem and you hear somebody else, it's it's sometimes nice to hear a new interpretation, but also you're like, damn, that's not entirely what I was, <laughs> right? So what do you hope people get from this collection? That's a great question. <laughs> um, and I think it's going to vary depending on who the person is and where they are at their stage of life. But I'm hoping that this book brings peace, right? I'm hoping that it reaches people who, like myself, are also grappling with the history of Bangladesh, with all this violence that we have in the world in the past, as well as our present. And it can bring a sense of solace. And that's, I mean, that's what I got out of writing the book. And so I'm hoping that my readers are able to also pick up on that as well. I, I think they will. <laughs> Yeah, I hope so, because that's definitely what I experienced going through the course of this. Uh, okay, another audience question here. Uh, Pithra asks, uh, how do you see fiction and poetry as genres and one influencing the other? I think that's a great question. You do have some amazing prose poetry in here. That's a particularly wonderful blend. Uh, so yeah, how do you feel that they influence each other? That's a great, great, great question. So I personally struggle with borders and when defining genres. Um, and so to me, prose poetry kind of feels like the perfect fit because I write really lyrical prose and sure. really <laughs> short poetry. And to me, I feel like those two kind of come together because, um, because it just makes sense in my head. That's how I see the world. Um, and yeah, I don't think of them as separate genres. They just kind of are together and the vessel is dependent on the sort of content that you want to get across. So for example, I have a short story about Mowgli and um, Balu, and that just felt right as a short story <laughs> versus like Mowgli and Balu in a poem wouldn't make too much sense because their personalities are so large. So it mm. kind of depends on what can kind of fit within the vessel. Ooh, I love how you said that. The characters are just, I like that a lot. Um, ah, okay. Uh, so I have uh, just one more question then I'm gonna go to these last two here uh, in, the, in the chat. So I have a question more about uh, cover design. Right. Yeah. Uh, so I'm always curious because we really like how our authors are a little more involved in the process of this. So what was this like for you kind of getting to this image? I know it took a little bit of effort. We went through a couple cover designers. Uh, <laughs> and so we got to this right here. So how was this process for you? And I know you love it, but I want to hear you. It was definitely a journey. And I think the cover is one of my favorite parts of the book. So I really was drawn to um, traditional Bangladeshi folk art, especially the kind that you see on rickshaws, because when I was a child, I was just really captivated by how those drawings would show up. Um, they're often really bright, really flashy, um, and they have to be, right? Because you're wanting to attract a customer <laughs> to your particular rickshaw. Um, and so that was kind of the brief that I gave Catherine and Josh, and they were kind, they were kind enough to kind of roll with it too. <laughs> Um, and so obviously we had to have the two tigers, but I also added the little like water lilies on the corners. And then I also added these like gold sparkly bits to kind of, again, allude to the attention drawing aspect of the book. Um, but it was fun. I had a lot of fun um, creating the cover. And I'm just really glad that y'all are impressed that are really open to having your artists have so much input too. Oh my God, absolutely. I mean, this is your book, you know what I mean? Like when you see this, like, you know, this is a, a new, and it's just, it's so unique. It's so beautiful. Uh, so anyway, we got a couple more questions before I let you off the hook. <laughs> uh, so one from uh, Makeda and uh, first of all, giving some love to you, uh, but wants to know, do you have a fave poem or piece in your book? Yeah, I mean, all of these are my babies, obviously, and I love each and every single poem. Um, but I think right now, one of my favorites is definitely the on a map somewhere I find my grandmother's finger, um, just because I've been thinking a lot about family and about lineage. Um, and it's just a poem that gives me a lot of comfort. Um, and brings me back to a time when I was young enough that my finger could kind of curl around my grandmother's and yeah this time that you can't really get back 
Yeah, no, that's it's such an incredible poem. And I know that, that there was a couple people in the chat tonight that pointed out this particular line, but that she doesn't remember which nation she married. Like that's gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna stick. That's gonna ruminate for for a while. It's just it's it's a powerful little poem. Mm -hmm. uh, so to round us out tonight, I have a question from uh, Lei Ming. Uh, how did you choose which poems to cut from the book? Will any of those go into another book vessel? That's, Ooh, a, good that's a great, <laughs> great question. I think um, for this particular book, the themes that kind of emerged for me were about my relationship to God, especially in a post 9-11 world as a Muslim woman. Um, and then stemming from that, my relationship to womanhood under Islam, right? And those are the two main pots that I was kind of drawing from. But currently, I am working on my thesis, um, which is a collection of poetry based on this archival research that I've done on women incarcerated in Louisiana between the 1800 to 1913, um, kind of when they were staying in East Baton Rouge, because there's a full like architectural dig that was done here. There's like thousands of newspaper clippings. There's hundreds and hundreds of like prison records. And I want poetry to be the vessel in which I'm capturing the visceral experience of doing this research. And kind of, because a lot of the times I feel like when we have this research presented, it's presented almost without the human aspect of it. And so I want um, to use poetry as a way to kind of bring back humanity into these stories and expand on it. So I guess that's my next project. Um, if Game Over Books wants to purchase it, you never know. There might be a second book coming out. I didn't want to say anything. I'm <laughs> <laughs> waiting for Josh to put it in the comments. <laughs> uh, well, that's. I think that's all. All she wrote. That's all the questions I have. We got some good questions from the audience tonight. We had an incredible reading. I just want to say so. Shout out again to Chisara. Uh, just shout out to Ariel Francisco here this evening, and of course to the most important person tonight, yourself, Nuha, thank you. This is just, folks, if you've already ordered this book, I'm so stoked for you to get your hands on it. If you have not, gameoverbooks.com or a local independent bookstore near you or bother your local library about it, get them on this, they won't regret it. Uh, and with that, also a big thank you to all of you, our audience tonight. Uh, it's been such an absolute pleasure to have everyone here. There's been so much love tonight, which we love to see it. Could have been doing anything, and you spent it tonight celebrating this book and some amazing writers. Uh, and so with that, that's our show. Thank you for coming along.